Well, good evening, and welcome to Airmanship 2.0, case study number four. I think I can. Before we get rolling this evening, I notice there's quite a few uh, folks attending this evening who have not attended one of these webinars before, or at least with us. So let me give you a quick check out here on the control panel. Uh, that should be on the upper right of your screen. Uh, first thing to note is that there's a little white arrow inside a orange rectangle that collapses uh, or expands your control panel. I also like to draw your attention to the icon here that the arrow is pointing at, the raise your hand icon. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with this many people on the webinar, uh, I can't uh, monitor the text messages. So that's why I've got the big uh, no on this. You won't be able to text message me uh, during the webinar. So if you have a question or comment, please just raise your hand by pressing on the raise your hand icon. Uh, please be a little patient though. I have a roster here on my control panel, but it only displays about five or six names at a time and I have to scroll up and down to check for uh, those raised hands. So if you uh, raise your hand, just be patient and I'll get to you as soon as I uh, see it on the uh, roster. Now, I'm sure you've already noticed this is a PowerPoint presentation, and it is a webinar, but uh, no sleeping. Because you're going to get uh, one WINGS program uh, credit for this session. The sponsors of this uh, webinar are the FAA Safety Team and the Center for Airmanship Excellence. Before we get rolling, I'd like to uh, kind of get to know a few of you here tonight who haven't been on before. Uh, and uh, I'll start, though, by sharing a little bit about my flying background. Right now, though, I'm instructing at Skill Aviation, which is based up at Waukegan Airport with a satellite base at Chicago Executive Airport. Flying uh, the DA-20 right now. I just checked out yesterday, as a matter of fact. I'm just getting back into airplane instructing, if you will. I've been doing simulator instructing at Glass Simulator at Aurora Airport for about the last five years. But, uh, you know, that uh, itch for doing some more flying just finally got to the point where I had to scratch it. So I've teamed up with the skill guys, great uh, team of instructors, and good flight school uh, uh, up at uh, Waukegan and uh, Chicago Exec. And I'm looking forward to doing a lot of instructing uh, with them. Uh, I'll also be flying the uh, Skyhawk and uh, DA-42 and probably some uh, Cirruses as part of that uh, training up there. Uh, I, Again, I'm hoping to fly about uh, oh, 10, 15 hours a month uh, once I get rolling here. I haven't been flying very much the last few years. Uh, I've been flying for about 50 years. I've got over 18,000 hours. I uh, flew for United Airlines for 22 years. While I was with United, I flew for the Illinois Army National Guard and, Reserve, and the Reserves uh, for almost 10 years. Got about uh, oh, I'm pushing 1,000 hours in helicopters and I was an instructor pilot there and so forth. Uh, I've also been a personal flyer, as I like to term it, for many, many years. Uh, I've owned airplanes since I was a teenager, bought my first one when I was 17, a champ. And I've owned about air, eight airplanes over the years, so I've, I've pretty much always been involved with personal flying. And of course, what brought me to this webinar is that I'm uh, passionate about spreading the word about Airmanship 2.0. I think it has nothing but positive things that it can do for us as personal flyers uh, uh, directly and also for the personal flying segment of the general aviation industry. So with that, a uh, little bit of background. Uh, let me uh, at random open up a mic here. Uh, by the way, I keep the mics muted because otherwise there's too much feedback. So there again, if you have a question or comment, please raise your hand. I've opened up Stephen Frank's mic. Stephen, are you there? Yes, I am. Well, Stephen, would you mind sharing uh, the answers to some of these questions with us? Sure. Well, uh, the kind of flying I do, I'm just a private pilot. I work at uh, Dane County Airport in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and I fly the Cessna 172s and 152s. And uh, as far as uh, how much flying I do, I try to fly at least twice a week. And uh, um, I've been trying to attend, attend uh, some of the uh, WINGS uh, programs, and I've seen this uh, webinar. I think I got it on an email or something through either FAST or uh, uh, 
I don't know, maybe it was through the FAA, I'm not sure. But I started flying in 1996, and uh, then I quit for about eight or nine years because I was pretty busy trying to raise a family and everything, and it got kind of expensive, but now I'm back into it. Well, good, good. Yeah, you re everybody that is attending tonight got a, a notice from the FAST team called the SPAN system, so you got an email about this. So, well, thanks right. for joining us, Stephen. We, we just expanded the reach of these webinars. We've been holding them here in the Chicago area, uh, webinars and seminars related to Airmanship 2.0 for about a year and a half, but we just, with this uh, webinar, started reaching out a little further, so we're glad to hear some of our Wisconsin neighbors are joining us this evening. Well, thank you. All right, let me uh, pick somebody else at random here. I recognize this name, uh, Randy Tritz, because you sent me an email, Randy, said you were on the train, but I, I guess you made it and you're hooked up with us. Are you there, Randy? Well, hopefully, David. I hope you can hear me. I'm tied in while I'm driving, which is uh, not texting, I must admit. Are you there? <laughs> yeah, we uh, got you. I, I'm tied in. Uh, the the, the um, intersection just came clear, so there we go. I've uh, been flying uh, since 82. I generally average about 100 to uh, 150 hours a year. Most of it uh, is uh, getting back and forth to my clients. I'm a, a consultant, so I do uh, use the, the plane as my second automobile. Now, occasionally, I get a chance to go spend some time uh, looking at the, uh, the leaves up north. Uh, I fly out of Bravo Uniform Uniform, which is uh, just southwest of Milwaukee and West Mercine. I've another one of those cheese heads up here for you. But, uh, been flying, like I said, since 82. It's, uh, the webinar itself is, the, again, through the past is where I came in line with that. Great. Well, thank you, Randy. Glad you could uh, make it and got to uh, be careful out there driving, though. How about uh, Natalie Turner? I've opened up your mic. Are you there, Natalie? I am here. I am a, I'm actually a, I'm a student pilot, and um, I'm active in Civil Air Patrol in the 99s and the whole nine yards. I fly a 172. And I am almost ready for my check ride. So this year, um, I've logged about 50 hours so far. I came to the webinar because um, safety really is the absolute most important aspect of flying. And um, I'm shocked sometimes at the level of proficiency of the actual pilot. So I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it the best that I can. Well, thank you, Natalie. That sure uh, warms the cockle of my old black heart here. That's exactly uh, what uh, we're trying to get more people to do. And uh, there, the Civil Air Patrol is one of the areas in general aviation that has been employing things like uh, what, that we call Airmanship 2.0. And so I think you'll you'll find some of these things familiar here that you're going to hear tonight. So thanks for joining us, Natalie. All right, I'm going to. I've noticed that. Uh, uh, John Kuyper's on this evening. John is a uh, one of our committee members on the Center for Airmanship Excellence. He heads up the Flight Operations Support Committee. Uh, and John has been taking some interesting flying lessons lately. So, John, I've opened up your mic. Would you share with everybody what you've been up to, please? Good evening, everyone. Um, well, the latest project is a helicopter rating. I've been uh, flying about four or five uh, days a week in an R-22 out of uh, Indianapolis. Um, much more fun than flying fixed wing. <laughs> yep, I couldn't agree with you being an old rotor head myself, John, as I've mentioned to you before. All right. Well, uh, th I think that gives everybody kind of a flavor for uh, who's on the webinar this evening. It sounds like uh, we're all personal flyers, and uh, uh, some of us have a little more flying background than others. But uh, the uh, this webinar has been designed to to uh, reach out to uh, people of all levels of flying who are flying for personal reasons. All right, let's move on. This webinar uh, will examine an airmanship-related accident that could have been prevented if the pilot had been practicing Airmanship 2.0. This case study involves a fatal crash that occurred during VMC into IMC flight. Well, if we're going to talk about uh, this case study in terms of Airmanship 2.0, uh, we need to define it for those of you who have not been exposed to it before. I noticed there's a few folks on the webinar this evening who have attended one or more 
airmanship uh, webinars or seminars. So for the next 10 minutes, uh, you can go get a cup of coffee, relax, uh, or if you want to uh, go through this again, uh, maybe it'll jog your uh, memory on some questions that might have come up since you last saw the briefing on Airmanship 2.0, and uh, you'll have some things to contribute to the conversations, questions to ask, uh, comments to make. Uh, the Airmanship 2.0, uh, when we talk about it, I have to uh, define that asterisk, uh, is that this is how the Center for Airmanship Excellence defines Airmanship 2.0. So you won't find Airmanship 2.0 in the FAA handbooks or uh, in the AIM or uh, and nobody else has used this this particular definition. We uh, made it up uh, because it fits what we're talking about. It's a new way of approaching airmanship for those of us who are personal flyers. Uh, and so what you're about to see here in, in a nutshell is what we call Airmanship 2.0. And again, I want to place it in the context of personal flying. We're not talking about uh, Airmanship 2.0 as it pertains to uh, professional flying or military flying and so forth. Airmanship 2.0 really asks the question, if I don't fly right, should I fly at all? Now, that seems like a simple question, but that's really kind of profound. And, and uh, uh, those of us who have been looking at this now for a while, <clears throat> excuse me, as a way to approach personal flying, uh, the deeper you think about this, the uh, more profound it is. Because if you read that literally, if I don't fly right, now we have to define what flying right is, but should I even fly at all? That's, that's a big decision to quit flying if you're not doing it right. And Airmanship 2.0 answers that question. If you're going to fly, do it right. Now, we lifted that quote from the book, Redefining Airmanship, which was written by Dr. Slash Colonel Tony Kern, Air Force guy, uh, which a lot of this Airmanship 2.0 ideas and approaches are based on. Uh, and Kern quotes Jaeger in the book as saying this, but he points out that Jaeger has been saying this since he was a young aviator. So it isn't just the old paranoid throttle jockey like all of us get after we fly a lot of years. This, he's been saying this forever, and, and, and this is the way he approaches flying. If you're going to fly, do it right. So that's how a first definition, if you will, a first quick look at what we believe Airmanship 2.0 is. It's doing it right. Airmanship 2.0 is a new paradigm in personal flying. However, it's based on tried and true airmanship principles that have been proven to be effective with the airlines and the military. Uh, those principles and techniques and procedures and so forth have been modified for use by us personal flyers in today's flight environment at a reasonable cost. So a lot of people will say, well, you know, you can't operate like the airlines operate because it costs too much money. Well, it turns out that there are ways to do what the airlines do in terms of airmanship. Uh, to make the operation safer, more enjoyable, smoother, more efficient that we can do in personal flying that really don't cost a lot of money. Probably end up saving quite a bit of money in the long run. Airmanship 2.0 is a new way for you to enjoy flying. It's a new approach to maximizing the personal rewards you get from flying. Airmanship 2.0 increases the value you get for your flying dollar. And I think we're all really focused on that nowadays as the cost of personal flying keeps rising rather rapidly uh, with no end in sight. Uh, those dollars we do spend for our flying, we need to maximize them to get maximum value out of them. And Airmanship 2.0 is designed to help us do that. Airmanship 2.0 continuously enhances your airmanship skills, knowledge, and capabilities. Airmanship 2.0, in short, is a surefire way for you to become a safer, more proficient aviator. Airmanship 2.0 includes 
flying in what we call another another name we made up airmanship development support organization and of course we have to have an acronym for that ADSO A D S O now an ADSO is a generic term it could be a flying club it could be a flight school a rental operation a charter operation a corporate operation it could be you uh, if you can get an organization around you and, and as you dig into how Airmanship 2.0 works, you, you can, you'll see that you can create your own ADSO around yourself as one way to do this. But Airmanship development uh, requires uh, that you fly within an organization of some kind. It won't work without it, we believe. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is uh, Airmanship 2.0 includes belonging to a high-performing safety culture with all of these features. You can't have a safety culture like this all by yourself. Culture implies a group of people. Airmanship 2.0 also includes using a safety management system, a formal safety management system with these components that is implemented throughout that safety culture in the ADSO. Airmanship 2.0 provides you with structured airmanship challenges that are, oops, excuse me, I slipped on a switch there, are fun offer recognition and rewards, are bite size, and provide continuous improvement. Airmanship 2.0, here's a quick formula for you to keep it in your mind, what it is, how it works. Uh, it's airmanship challenges plus fun plus recognition equals continuous airmanship development. So this is a formula that we can all use to help ourselves to continuously develop our airmanship. Airmanship 2.0 includes your formal airmanship training. So you're, when you're training for certificates and ratings and endorsements and checkouts and new airplanes, that's formal training. It includes that. But it also includes your informal airmanship training. Every flight you take, you should have a training plan for that flight. You should be uh, addressing some challenges that will increase your airmanship capabilities. If you put your formal and informal airmanship training together, that equals your personal airmanship development plan. And we believe every aviator should have a personal airmanship development plan. Now, Airmanship 2.0 includes a personal training team made up of a training management group, mentor pilots, senior instructors, and associate instructor. So rather than just having one instructor or maybe a couple that you go see for different things or you just hook up with an instructor when you're going for a certificate or a rating, Airmanship 2.0 provides you with a personal team, a personal training team that works with you throughout your flying career to help you with that continuous airmanship development. Uh, airmanship 2.0 includes airmanship development tools. Here's just one example. Uh, this is called an Apario Vision 1000 system. This unit is about the size of your palm of your hand. You can see it's mounted on the overhead in the cockpit. It has a video recorder, audio recorder, but it also has a flight data recorder in it. So airspeed, altitude, heading, uh, pitch, roll, yaw, uh, the uh, accelerations, just a regular formal flight data recorder is included in that unit. So it records all your flights, and then after the flight, you access it through the Internet, and you can look at the, what you did on that flight in many different ways. Here you can see uh, a graphic of the aircraft. Uh, you can see this, the instruments, graphic representation instruments. You could be looking at the video, too, listening to the audio. You can see traces here. This, this might be, for example, your altitude in a, in a steep turn. You can see how it varied. So it gives you tools to self-assess how you're doing as an airman and helps you to improve uh, your airmanship skills. It also provides your airmanship uh, development team, your training team, with this information to help you become a better airman. Airmanship 2.0 includes the aircraft you fly, whether they be new airplanes, old airplanes, uh, high-tech airplanes, TAAs, uh, or old uh, you know, Piper Cubs. Uh, but Airmanship 2.0 pilots 
make sure their airplanes are in airworthy condition. And of course, we have a lot of issues now with aging aircraft. Uh, about 40%, I believe, of the personal flying fleet is uh, average age is over 40. Uh, maybe might be higher than that, but we have a lot of aging aircraft in the fleet, so those airplanes are okay if they're maintained meticulously. But also, you should uh, airmanship uh, guys who are practicing airmanship 2.0 also have the latest safety devices in their aircraft, like uh, parachute recovery systems and airbags and satellite phones and satellite tracking systems and collision avoidance systems. All of those things that are available to us now that make us better aviators, safer aviators, uh, make the flight safer for our passengers. Airmanship, pilots who are practicing Airmanship 2.0 uh, look for those things too. But I will point out that a big part of Airmanship 2.0 is, uh, wrong button again, operator, is flying tail draggers. Uh, getting an initial training in tail draggers so you're proficient in takeoffs and landings, all forms of them, and, ta and tail dragger, and then maintaining that proficiency in the tail dragger on a recurrent basis because uh, the vast majority of all of the accidents that we personal flyers get ourselves into involve takeoffs and landings. We believe that if you are proficient, not just learn it once, but you're proficient in flying a tail dragger, that most of those problems will go away for, for those who are practicing Airmanship 2.0. Airmanship 2.0 includes the way that you fly the aircraft, whether it be for personal transportation, for the challenge, or for the fun of it, or a combination of all three of those things. Airmanship 2.0 addresses all of those things. Airmanship 2.0 includes a flight operations support team, a central factor in, in making the airlines and the military operations as safe as they are. And, and I'll point back again to the Civil Air Patrol. They're, they have adopted and they are adopting procedures like we're talking about here that have actually proven to be much uh, make their operation much safer over the last couple of years. Uh, part of that, a big part of it, is shared decision making. Uh, at the airlines, uh, whenever, when I flew for United, they never let me have the keys to one of those jets until the dispatcher also signed off on the flight. So it was shared decision making between the dispatch team and me and, of course, my crew, too, I had on the team. It was shared decision making. It wasn't just one person making that go, no go decision. I believe that if we look at the links in the error chain leading to most accidents in personal flying today, almost all of them, uh, that first link is laid on that go-no-go no go decision. Uh, how the flight was planned, how the risks were assessed, were, you know, did they have, was there shared decision making involved, all of those kinds of things. So if you're going to practice Airmanship 2.0, you need to be operating within that ADSO, that Airmanship Development Support Organization, that has a flight operations support team. And here's how they support you. They can help you with trip planning so that your mind stays clear of the details and you can keep uh, your eye on the overall picture, be thinking about the big picture things in the trip planning phase. Now, if you like doing your own flight planning, that's fine. It gets submitted to the uh, flight ops support team and they check it all for you. And if they agree, or they might have suggestions, or you can turn it around the other way and have the flight ops support team do your flight planning for you, and then you check it and add to it or change it, whatever. Uh, that's a good way to do it because that flight ops support team has more resources, more time to do a better job of trip planning and flight planning. Uh, but you can you could do it either way. The, the point is you have more than just one person uh, in the process. Uh, and by the way, I never did a flight plan the whole 22 years I flew for United. Dispatch always did the flight plan. Then that go no go decision, the flight dispatch is is crucial for every flight. Again, helps you assist you in making that go no go decision, supports you, makes it safer, makes it easier. Uh, then uh, the flight ops support teams track you with satellite tracking system, so that they always know where you are. Uh, I don't I don't know if you folks have been keeping up with what's happening with ELTs lately, uh, but you know what I'm reading and seeing uh, looks like. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to rely on ELT uh, because they don't go off a lot of times. Uh, the satellites aren't monitoring them anymore if they're 125 ELTs. Uh, so 
uh, really the best way to do this is to have somebody tracking you with a satellite tracking system, the flight ops support team, all the time. We call that flight following, following your flight. Uh, and then if, if you get into a problem, you can push a button on the satellite tracking system in the cockpit, sends out an emergency signal, and dispatch knows right then and there you've got a problem. The satellite uh, tracking system starts sending out your GPS position every two seconds so that uh, it, it sees where you uh, terminate the flight, and, uh, and if you have, and then they dispatch the rescue people. So it takes the search out of search and rescue could be uh, criti critical and life-threatening situations that they get to you right away. So they provide flight tracking. Also provide in-flight support because if you're flying these airplanes we're talking about with a uh, set phone in the, the airplane, which is now feasible in light aircraft. In fact, Garmin came out with one about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago now, that's light and affordable, uses the Iridium system of satellites. So you can always be in communication. So you're never out there alone with a flight ops support team and a sat phone. You can call them for information. One of the highest risk uh, factors is when you change the plan in flight. And we call that trip management. Well, if you have to do that all by yourself when you're in flight, let's say you've decided to divert to an alternate. Well, a lot of times there's arrangements that have to be made or you would like to make, like let the family know or the people you were going to meet. You know, flight service won't do that stuff for you. Uh, so it's nice to be able to call flight ops support team and say, you know, hey, I'm changing. Would you change all the arrangements? Call these people. Take care of that for you vice versa, or also in that case, they can pull up all the information you need for that change. Also, the flight ops support team, because they're tracking your flight, can call you, let's say, pop-up TFRs, a change in the weather. They can just make sure, again, uh, support, they can make sure that you see that change in the weather, or maybe a NOTAM came out after you took off about your destination, all kinds of things. Again, just like the airlines and military do, they have a flight ops support team that provides that support for you. Well, that's the quick overview on Airmanship 2.0, and I, you might not have thought that was real quick, but there's a lot of elements to it. This is just really the tip of the iceberg. If you want to find out more about it, uh, go to the uh, airmanshipexcellence.org. That's the website for the Center for Airmanship Excellence. Uh, by the way, the Center for Airmanship Excellence, for those of you who don't know about it, is a nonprofit of all volunteer organization. We have about two dozen volunteers now working on projects at the Center for Airmanship Excellence. And the purpose of the center is to support uh, those personal flyers who uh, want to become excellent airmen. We're always pursuing airmanship excellence. So there's a lot of resources on airmanshipexcellence.org. And in this case, we're talking about the the uh, section on Airmanship 2.0. If you go into that section, you'll find all kinds of information about it, give you all the details that we have right now about what Airmanship 2.0 is, how to practice it, and so forth. Well, okay, that's uh, the quick briefing on Airmanship 2.0, so we have the context for analyzing this case study. But we'll pause for just a second, give you guys a chance to ask questions or make comments. If you have any, please raise your hand now. Okay, either that was a good thorough explanation or you're all asleep. I see no hands, so we'll move on. All right, let's get into this case study. I title it, I think I can, like the little engine. He got out there, this guy got out there, and he, I think I can make it, I think I can make it. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation, but uh, back when I practiced Airmanship 2.0, before I learned Airmanship 1.0, I'm sorry, other way around. When I practiced Airmanship 1.0 before I learned Airmanship 2.0, I can think back to more than one situation where I was out there thinking I could make it, but I wasn't sure of it. And of course, that's not a very healthy attitude in, in aviation, just to think you can get something done. This accident uh, aircraft was a Cessna 210 Delta. The accident took place on January 1st, 1989, so wintertime. Pilot and three passengers pilot was not instrument rated, but he had 2,500 hours total time. 
the flight uh, was planned from Fort Myers, and they l actually got off the ground there at about 9.30 in the morning Eastern. And their destination was Lansing, Illinois, up here at all, good old uh, India Golf, Quebec. Total flight time en route estimated was 5 hours and 30 minutes, so a pretty good jot. But they did plan a fuel stop, as you'll see here. But uh, as I'm sure you've heard before, a flight of this duration, this length, spanning a good chunk of the country uh, by a pilot who's not instrument rated is, is one of the first links in that error chain that we're, we're going to talk about here. The first leg of the flight was from Fort Myers to uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, which was about 3 hours and 30 minutes ETE. So he did plan a fuel stop, he wasn't going to try to make the five and a half uh, non-stop in the 210, which wouldn't have been able to do it with three passengers especially. So he had a, he had a decent plan, uh, although uh, uh, three and a half hours is kind of stretching it uh, uh, in the first leg. I might have split that up in half, but uh, that was the plan. And then uh, he actually flew up to uh, uh, Tango Hotel Alpha and refueled. But while he was refueling, he did not obtain a weather update. So he was making a long flight. Uh, it, the, the report, the accident report uh, doesn't say whether or not the pilot obtained a weather briefing before he left Fort Myers, but there is evidence that was reported that he did not get a weather briefing uh, at uh, Tullahoma. He departed Tullahoma VFR en route to Lansing. Shortly after takeoff from Tullahoma, they encountered deteriorating weather. Uh, he decided to land at Vermilion County Airport in Danville, Illinois, which was an hour and 45 minutes en route. So he started encountering the deteriorating weather shortly after takeoff on this leg, this last leg, uh, but he kept plowing through it for an hour and 45 minutes. Unknown to the pilot, the weather had deteriorated drastically. The weather at uh, Danville was sealing in definite obscured visibility one quarter mile in fog. Now here's the uh, approach plate for the ILS uh, runway 21 at Danville and you can see uh, the straight in ILS minimums are a half mile so it was even an instrument rated pilot that was uh, really sharp, proficient, having a good day, that'd be a challenging approach for him. And th this particular accident pilot, as you recall, didn't even have an instrument rating. Uh, so a pilot without an instrument rating was attempting a very difficult approach. The aircraft crashed into trees 35 feet AGL, five miles north of the airport. So as you noticed, uh, that was a runway 21, so the final approach course was running down to the southeast, so he was north of the airport. He wasn't even on the final approach course. He was out there maneuvering somehow trying to get to the ILS, I assume. Uh, unfortunately, there's no details in the report on, on what happened, if, uh, if he had any assistance, radar, or anything else. Apparently not. Uh, the pilot was killed and one of the passengers. Uh, two passengers were seriously injured. Uh, there was no evidence of aircraft malfunction. The NTSB cause that they issued was continued flight by a non instrumented pilot into IMC. And we hear, we've been hearing that for a long time. There are hundreds of accidents uh, due to this every year, and, uh, uh, but it keeps happening over and over again. And I think this cartoon says it all. The NTSB cause also said, Pilot's failure to maintain sufficient altitude. Well, okay. Obviously, hit the trees. All right. I have some questions about uh, about this uh, case study for you. It will help us to uh, talk about it in terms of airmanship 2.0. So if you'll bear with me just one second. Uh, uh, this particular system here for uh, asking you the questions uh, can be a little uh, um, operator intensive, so stand by. Here we go. There's the first question. 
Do you think the go, no go decision that would have been go, or you think it would have been go if the pilot had been practicing airmanship 2.0? So he made that decision by himself to go on that flight, given the factors that we've seen and the second leg especially. Do uh, you think if he'd been practicing airmanship 2.0, he would have done that? Okay, the votes are rolling in. I'll give you a little more time here to vote. A few more people are voting, but not quite everyone yet, so I, now I'm beginning to believe somebody is asleep. Okay, looks like that everybody who's going to vote has voted, so I'll close that question and share it with you. So 4% say yes, and 88% say no, and 8% say not sure. Here's my opinion. If he was practicing airmanship 2.0, within uh, that airmanship development support organization, that safety culture within the organization would have included in their flight operations manual, which is part of a safety culture, uh, a, a rule that everybody agreed to that flies in that organization. That rule would be shared decision making on the go, no go decision. Uh, the dispatchers would have known the situation, they would have known the pilot's qualifications, capabilities, uh, had a lot of other pertinent information about the situation, and I, I believe that they would not have agreed to release the flight under that situation. So I don't think he would have uh, made the go decision. Okay, I've got a few more for you here, help us analyze it. Do you think the pilot in command would have done a more thorough and methodical risk analysis if he had been practicing airmanship 2.0. Okay, it looks like everyone who's going to vote has voted. I'll close the poll share it with you. And 100% who voted say yes. I agree, 100%. Uh, the, as part of that safety culture, there's a safety management system. As part of the safety management system, uh, the use of a flight risk assessment tool for every flight is mandatory. And if you've never seen a flight risk assessment tool, just ask the Google uh, for a flight risk assessment tool. Three or four will come up. The FAA has a good one. Uh, the AOPA has one that's fairly good if you use the long form. Uh, there's a few others around. They're all about the same, and you'll see how they work. But basically, a flight risk assessment tool asks you a series of questions about the known risks on a flight. We, there are, on every flight, we have our known risks and we have our unknown risks. What we want to do is identify the known risks. Well, they're about the same on every flight except uh, for the degree of the risk. And so if you look at every one of those risk factors, evaluate it, give it a numerical uh, value, which is not precise, but it's, it helps to evaluate your overall risk and specific risk, and then areas where there's high risk, you can look at strategies to mitigate the risk and bring your overall risk down, identify where the risk is going to be high, and uh, so you're aware of it at those parts of the flight and so forth. Excellent tool. Uh, I won't even ask right now how many of you are using them because I, in, in seminars, I always ask this question, and I'll get less than 1% of the attendees will say they're using flight risk assessment tools. I use one before every flight. I teach my students to use one before every flight. I think they're excellent uh, safety tools. So uh, uh, if he had been uh, an airmanship again, 2.0 includes that, so he would have been uh, done a much better job of assessing the risks associated with that flight. All right, here's another one for you. Do you think the pilot would have been flying this type of mission if he had been practicing 2.0, airmanship Okay, looks like everybody uh, has voted. Share it with you. 
Well, we have a little more mixed results this time. Yes, 26%, no, 61%, and 13%, not sure. Uh, you know, every uh, everybody has, uh, I say every pilot has at least two or three strongly held opinions on every issue, so I guess I'm, I'm uh, uh, surprised that we don't have well over 100% on the uh, opinions here. Uh, the uh, This is a, a little bit more uh, difficult to interpret this question as it relates to this accident because I didn't give you a whole lot of information on this. Uh, but under Airmanship 2.0, you qualify uh, for using an airplane in, in different ways. So in this case, he wanted to use that 210 to fly a long cross country in all in that in IFR weather uh, and uh, winter time, uh, so forth. So if within an ADSO there would be a uh, a qualified or a quantitative list of qualifications that that pilot would have to achieve and maintain if he wanted to do that kind of mission, if he wanted to make the long cross country on that kind of day. So he, if he was practicing airmanship 2.0, uh, he wouldn't have, he would have known he wasn't qualified. And of course the disc, the flight ops support team would have known that he wasn't qualified and uh, that flight wouldn't have been released. Here's another one for you. Do you think the pilot would have obtained an instrument rating if he had been practicing airmanship 2.0? Okay, it looks like everyone has voted. Share it with you. 67% yes, 4% no, and 29% not sure. Uh, as I mentioned under Airmanship 2.0, it's, it's all based on a personal airmanship development plan, continuous airmanship development. He had, as you recall, 2,500 hours of flying time. If he had been flying within an ADSO, practicing Airmanship 2.0 through at least you know part of that time, his, his flight training team, his mentor pilot, the other his peers, other folks would have been telling him, hey, if you want to fly that 210, like you're flying it around the country, you really need to be working on that instrument rating. Now, the beauty of Airmanship 2.0, it, it breaks up that instrument rating into uh, bite-sized pieces, so it's not all just one big chunk at one time, so that you're becoming, first of all, safe on instruments. If you get into a situation like this, you can escape it and live, and then you get to the point where you can not only survive it, but you can extricate yourself in a in a uh, the proper manner from it, and then as you continue to build your capabilities, you eventually get the instrument rating, and then getting the instrument rating isn't the end point, because if you just get that instrument rating, you're not really ready to go out there and fly in this kind of weather, for sure, so you have to keep increasing your qualifications with the instrument rating. So if he was practicing Airmanship 2.0, I believe he would have had that, inst that instrument rating, and at least survived the encounter. All right, a couple more questions. Do you think the pilot would have been more methodical in his flight planning if he had been practicing airmanship 2.0? More methodical in his flight planning. Okay, everybody says yes. Uh, that is a big part of Airmanship 2.0 is being methodical, having flight discipline. So he, I believe, I, I agree with you guys, he, he would have uh, done a better job. He was obviously very sloppy with his flight planning, especially after that fuel stop. Didn't even check the weather. Okay, let me get another one up here for you. Hang on just one second. This is not operator friendly uh, launching these questions. Do you think the pilot would have exhibited better situational awareness if he had been practicing airmanship 2.0? Okay, everybody's voted. 
and 96% say yes and 4% not sure. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, we're going to look at uh, how, air, how take a quick look at how situational awareness is practiced uh, with Airmanship 2.0. But uh, I'll, I'll give you a little preview on that, that if he was practicing Airmanship 2.0, he definitely would have had a lot better situational awareness than he exhibited on this flight. All right, one last question that I think will, uh, again, help us to uh, analyze this. Do you think you could make the mistakes this pilot made? Okay, looks like everyone's voted. And interesting spread here. We have yes, 42% uh, say yes, they could have made that mistake. 42% uh, say no, they wouldn't have made those mistakes. And 17% say not sure. So uh, this points out uh, two very interesting things. First of all, under Airmanship 2.0, uh, you learn self-awareness. You learn how to self-assess, self-evaluate. Uh, and one of the things that you become aware of as you learn the techniques that you use to be self-aware and self-evaluate, self-assess, uh, is that uh, you always think you're better than uh, you really are. We're lousy at self-assessment, in other words. We need other people helping us uh, evaluate our capabilities. Not just other people. We need them helping us. Uh, also, uh, uh, as you study Airmanship 2.0, you see that anybody can make mistakes like this, uh, but not maybe not the same mistakes. Uh, for example, if I have, uh, with all my experience flying our instruments, I wouldn't have the problem of handling that instrument weather, but I can make mistakes if I'm just out there by myself and don't have uh, any backup, any shared decision making. So the bottom line here is we can all make these mistakes, but under Airmanship 2.0, we recognize them, and we know how to uh, work around them. All right. Well, thank you for uh, participating in all those questions, uh, and I think I hope that helped you to see how we look at Airmanship 2.0 uh, by looking at that case study. So I'm going to just give me one second to scroll up and down the roster here to see if anybody has any questions or comments before we move on. We've got just a little bit more here to do because I'd like to look at this case study uh, in uh, uh, another way here. Just hang on just one second. I just noticed I didn't get rid of the poll. Okay, there we go. Hmm, stand by. We're not getting the picture we should be getting on screen here, and I don't know why. Stand by just one second, please. All right, I, I have my laptop uh, also up as a monitor, and on my laptop, I'm only getting uh, uh, a, uh, the webinar uh, uh, front page and I'm not seeing the slide I have up. So hang on just one second. Uh, uh, John, I'm going to open up your mic. Hang on. Yeah, John Kuiper. Do you, what do you see on the screen right now? You got the uh, FAA Wings Program seminar. OK, you don't have the current airmanship uh, or the current airmanship no. model up, huh? No, that's uh, not. OK, well, uh, I'm going to close your mic. I'm going to leave it open, John. Tell me if you see it. I'm, what I'm going to do is. Stop showing my screen. Huh. Got judgment. Okay, there it is. Now it worked. I just had to cycle something there. Thanks, John. I'm going to close your mic. Okay, this is called the current airmanship model. This is, the, this is really the framework that we use for airmanship 2.0. The current airmanship model has uh, three bedrock principles, light discipline, skill, and proficiency. And upon those three bedrock principles, rest the five pillars of knowledge. Knowledge of self, knowledge of aircraft, knowledge of team, knowledge of environment, 
and knowledge of risk. And upon those five pillars of knowledge rests the desired outcome, capstone outcome, of situational awareness and then judgment. So what the current airmanship model, you'll, if you dig into this, you'll see what it does for you. If you know how to do all these things and you have all this knowledge, it drives your flying towards good situational awareness all the time, and good situational awareness is critical to good judgment. So let's, uh, and by the way, there's a lot more information on this in that Airmanship 2.0 section at airmanshipexcellence.org, so I'm, I won't go into any more detail. In fact, there's a whole, I believe it's 11 webinar FA Wings program series called the Current Airmanship Model in Detail, if you really want to dig into this, and that's available, all of it's free, at airmanshipexcellence.org in the Airmanship Excellence Archives. But in terms of this case study, if we look at it through the lens of the current airmanship model, uh, we'll see that uh, the uh, uh, model suggests that this pilot really lost situational awareness. Uh, and, and here are some of the clues that we use that we learn, kind of the triggers that turn on the caution warning light that tell us that we're starting to lose situational awareness. Failure to comply with the plan. He was planning on flying up there visually. VFR flight plan, or not even a flight plan, but VFR, VMC. As soon as that plan started to change, that's a caution and warning light for us, and that's where we know that if we don't take corrective action, we can start losing SA, or we have already started to lose SA. Also, another caution warning light, violating established rules or procedures, and that's what he was doing when he started flying into those clouds. So this is just an example of how using the current airmanship model uh, and what we know about how to acquire and maintain SA under airmanship 2.0 would have helped them out. Uh, the SA loss came from multiple failures. Flight into IMC uh, was failure of flight discipline. So that first bedrock principle of Airmanship 2.0, uh, he was obviously uh, lacking in that because if he had had discipline, he would have turned around at some personal minimum that he had set for sealing and visibility. So he didn't have dis good flight discipline. Uh, the failure to update the weather indicates he had a lack of knowledge of his environment. Remember, that's one of the pillars of knowledge, the environment you're flying in. So he, when he didn't get that weather briefing, he forego that knowledge of environment. Another indicator was failure to recognize his limitations. So he had lack of knowledge of self. Uh, confidence is an interesting thing. As pilots, we have to be confident. However, if we're overconfident, it can kill us. If we're underconfident, it can kill us, get us into trouble, or keep us from flying. So we have to be in that sweet spot on confidence. In Airmanship 2.0, you learn how to acquire true confidence and how then to evaluate whether or not, uh, when you're making a decision, based on your confidence that your, the outcome is going to be good, uh, it's valid confidence, so it's not uh, self-delusion and, and wishful thinking and denial. So failure to recognize limitations, obviously, that la he had lack of self-knowledge. Uh, all of that SA, loss of SA, led to flawed decisions because, as we saw in the current airmanship model, uh, we have to have good SA to have good judgment. So he exhibited poor judgment by continuing that flight into the clouds paid the ultimate price. Well, here are some takeaways. Uh, situational awareness is the filter through which every aviator's action must be viewed. Good situational awareness is essential to success in aviation. With SA, a pilot can fly efficiently, taking advantage of opportunities and avoiding pitfalls. Without SA, we misperceive important cues or proceed blindly into the unknown, which is basically what this guy just did. SA techniques and procedures can be learned. It's not a, not a black art. It's not something that just some of us are born with or we somehow get it through osmosis through our flying. They, we know what you have to learn. We know how you can learn it. The three bedrock principles and the five pillars of knowledge feed into the SA. So if you have flaws in the uh, bedrock principles or your five pillars of knowledge, you're not going to have good SA, you're not going to have uh, good judgment, and you're going to be vulnerable to bad outcomes. Airmanship 2.0 teaches how to maintain situational awareness. 
So, last chance for questions and comments. I'll pause just for a second and give you a chance. Okay, I see why you guys have your hand up because I uh, had a mute going there. But I think you, know, you could see that uh, operator on my end, so we can all make mistakes at any time. So, uh, uh, George Bullwinkle, I see your hand up. Is that what you wanted to tell me, or did you have a question or comment? I just wanted you to know I was not asleep, Dave. Thank you. That's very good. Okay. Uh, and uh, Gary Brinkman, I'm going to open up your mic. Did you have a question or comment? Yeah, the comment I had was uh, some of the other factors that I thought would be relative to this accident, and that is the old get their itis thing, and uh, you know, if there information on how many times this pilot has gotten by with flying in this type of weather before that caused him to, you know, do what we would think would be an obvious error. Very good point, Gary. Uh, with 2,500 hours, I suspect he had, he had done quite a bit of this. I'm going to close your mic, Gary, for because of feedback. I would suspect he had been doing quite a bit of this. And, and of course, you know, uh, you made the excellent point. When you get away with it once and try it again, get away with it twice, pretty soon you think you can always get away with it. And eventually it comes at the, the time when that comes to you. The get there itis, the external factor, as we call it in uh, uh, aeronautical decision making uh, probably was a huge factor. You know, if you had the three passengers, uh, there was probably a lot of pressure on them. So those are good points. And under Airmanship 2.0, you not only learn to recognize them, in fact, I talked about that flight risk assessment tool that addresses external factors like get their itis. You would, you, if you were using that tool, you would have uh, looked at that before the flight and evaluated it. Okay, I'm going to put, uh, put all the hands down and run through the roster one more time. Uh, so uh, anybody have any questions or comments? This is the time. Oop, got another uh, hand up. Uh, Natalie Turner, go ahead, please, Natalie. Um, I, I guess my question is, as you said, that he was aware of the, the deteriorating weather conditions very soon after the takeoff from Tennessee. Do they give how much time? I mean, obviously, if you know that weather's closing in or you see weather, it makes you stop and check. So I guess I'm confused as to why he continued on to Illinois, because it's not like it's just 10 more minutes. OK, Natalie, I've closed your mic for feedback. And yes, uh, the, the flight time from uh, Tullahoma up to Danville was about an hour and 45 minutes. So he can he continued into that bad weather for a considerable no, uh, amount of time. Unfortunately, there's no information in the uh, accident report as to what the weather was along that route, how quickly it deteriorated. Had he been flying in IFR weather for a long time? Uh, it isn't in the report. But uh, it's the same old thing that we see over and over where somebody gets into it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, he was probably proficient enough on instruments with that much time, I, I would hope that he was, to keep the airplane right side up and maybe even fly a course or fly a heading. And so uh, I suspect that after he got into it that, uh, you know, he, he was got into that situation, well, do I keep going and hope for better weather? Do I turn around? That's That gets to be a tougher decision all the time. Uh, in Airmanship 2.0, we teach early on, right after... Uh, private certificate or sports certificate that uh, an IMC, a VMC and IMC survival course, which is an airmanship challenge, uh, so that you uh, understand the, pro the, the problem better, you, but you are equipped with the skills 
and the plan, an escape plan to get out of that situation. And obviously the escape plan includes that 180 degree turn. Sometimes if you get caught, it fills in behind you. But in this case, he was, it looks like he continued to fly into deteriorating weather conditions for quite some time. So does that answer it for you, Natalie? Okay. All right. Let me one more scan through the list here because I don't want to cut anybody short if they have some questions or I want to make a comment. Okay, don't see any other hands up. We'll move on. Close this one out. So here are some suggested next steps if you found this analysis and discussion of Airmanship 2.0 interesting this evening. I'd recommend you go to the uh, airmanshipexcellence.org and register for airmanship updates. They're free. Uh, send out emails when uh, things are happening or things you uh, might want to know about related to airmanship. Uh, you can look for the briefings that you've missed in uh, this series or any of the other webinars that have been given over the last year and a half, there's quite a few of them now, uh, that have all been recorded and they're available free at airmanshipexcellence.org in the Airmanship Excellence archives. Uh, and if you don't get it, I'm going to continue this series. There's another one coming up, probably do several more here over the winter. So uh, uh, if you miss any of them, they're again available at airmanshipexcellence.org. A few days after we record them, we, we get them up on the website. You also might be interested in subscribing to my blog, Captain Dave's Hangar. Uh, it's all about airmanship. I don't blog about uh, you know the current state of affairs or politics or anything like that. Strictly about airmanship, and it's free, so you might want to subscribe to that. Uh, and uh, I'd ask that you, uh, if you found this interesting, watch for Airmanship 2.0 case study number five, which will be coming up in about three weeks, uh, and it's titled "Professional Approach?" Question mark. Last thing I'd like to suggest you do as next steps is spread the word about Airmanship 2.0. Whether you, uh, with this quick look at you've had at it this evening, whether you think it's uh, good, bad, you don't know yet, uh, I'd encourage you to start talking about it with the pilots that you know, the non-pilots that you know who are thinking about learning to fly, because we need to have a, a broad and extensive discussion about should we, as personal flyers, start flying this way. There's a lot of reasons why we should. Uh, you know, simple fact that we believe that personal flying is is uh, going to go over a cliff here within the next decade and be so expensive or not available to us in the U.S. that we'll lose this privilege we have. Uh, all the trend lines and the indicators in the industry, our segment of the industry, are down and to the right. They're going down pretty fast. Uh, so uh, it's important that we find a way to turn things around. We believe the way to turn things around is by adopting all of us, as many as we can get, adopt Airmanship 2.0 as the way we operate versus Airmanship 1.0 the way we've been operating. So uh, I'd like you to ask you to spread the word, get the, get the uh, dialogue going about it. Well, thank you very much for your time and, uh, and focus this evening. Uh, and also, as if those of you who contributed to the conversation, I really appreciate that. Uh, if you have any questions that come up after you think about this a little bit or comments, uh, please uh, let me know. There's a good phone number for me. Uh, I don't man that phone number 24-7, but it has a voicemail on it. So leave me a message. I'll get back to you. Or just leave a message with your thoughts. Appreciate that. There's my email address. Uh, send me an email. Or you can just hit the contact button at airmanshipexcellence.org and you get an email to me that way. Uh, again, we're at the phase of developing Airmanship 2.0. We want to get as much thinking on this as we can. Uh, most of the thinking that has been put into this so far has been from a bunch of very experienced uh, aviators. And we're, we're, we want a more diverse group. We do have some relatively inexperienced aviators that have made a lot of input, but we're looking for more all the time. So please let us know what you think. And I'll leave you with this final thought. Fly safely. <laughs>